Let me get some volume. Hi, this is Pastor Chris Byers of St. John's Lutheran Church. And here's another In the Clock Tower. Uh, this is for Sunday, the 16th of May. Uh, we had a great class this morning. And we just went through the next section or of the Bible study from Seed. Uh, our kids, they celebrated their final Sunday school class for this school year. So we just are getting back to trying to have things back to normal and uh, uh, really enjoy. We had a great uh, seed service, uh, uh, stepping stone service um, that we had, uh, stepping stones of faith as we looked uh, looking at each stage as our children are developing. We had three to third grade Bibles that were given out. We also put out uh, our uh, confirmation age Bibles that will lead them up through uh, into their adulthood. And uh, we also... Uh, gave gifts to our graduates. So it was a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Great celebration on our part. We are just so excited for what God is continuing to do. Um, and we're glad to have you. So I'm going to actually go to the uh, go to the worksheet here, and you'll have a copy of that to be able to follow along with. And uh, as we continue on in our, in our studies... But I am so excited for what what's going on and what God is doing with us as a, a ministry. Uh, and uh, next week, uh, it is my installation. Uh, so there will not be any Sunday school next Sunday uh, because of everything, all the activities. But we are going to have on Memorial Sunday, uh, we are going to have and continue on. And we're just going to finish up uh, the rest of the seed lessons uh, and um and then uh, see what we're going to go from there. But uh, everybody's been liking the worksheets, so we're going to have fun with that. Uh, we're starting out with the worksheet here, and let's just open up with a prayer. Uh, today's lesson is Demetrius Stirs Up Trouble. Uh, so let's pray. God Almighty, you are the one Lord God, King of heaven and earth. There is no one like you. Keep us strong, we pray, in the face of the idolatry that surrounds us in our culture. When we experience rejection, give us peace and remind us that we are in good company with those who have gone before us in the faith. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Uh, the introduction of this goes is, uh, Often we find that people in this world are not led by lofty ideals or personal virtue, but so rather by selfish concerns and basic interests. The craftsmen in Ephesus who claimed to be concerned about religion seemed much more motivated by their bottom line. So let's look at Acts. Uh, we're going to open up to Acts, uh, the uh, uh, 19th chapter, beginning at the 23rd verse. Uh, so let's, uh, let me get that merged over here. All right. So, all right. So here we are. Uh, if you have an English, uh, your Bible with you, just follow along there. I'm using the English Standard Version here. Um, but if you have your own Bible that you're comfortable with and normal, that you use normally, uh, definitely it's always good to have your own scriptures uh, to follow along with. But here we begin at the 23rd verse. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. 
These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades, and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with the, confu with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis, Artemis of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore... Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone. The courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if one, if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Now, what's going on here? Or what are the things that struck? Some of the things that really got everything was how the the rioting and the people were getting upset and not uh, not respecting one another, um, and how un, how common that is still today in in our world. Um, now, one of the questions came up, and I'll be honest, I probably should have just checked with my kids uh, more and more on this and still I uh, should probably sit down and have a greater conversation. They might tell me a lot more about Artemis and Diana and all these things as they are studying some of this stuff. Uh, but I, I did pull up a little thing that I found um, just kind of put together by a doctor in, 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 uh, um, in, in uh, ministry here as he was looking up Artemis. And this is Artemis here that you'll see on your screen, uh, Artemis of the Ephesians. So just give us a little bit of discussion now. Uh, uh, little things I'm reading here that I've read through and just some quick review. Uh, there's a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of unknowns about this goddess Artemis. Um, so uh, what we see is, uh, here, hold on here. Let's see if I can get this to move forward. Well, all right. Now, I did have a presentation here, uh, but there's only one slide that I'm seeing right now. Um, so I am going to have to say, here we have an image of Artemis. Um, one of the things about Artemis that I was reading on there is uh, that image here. Actually, I'm going to go right back to there because I think you want to see just so I can talk, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that image there, you see all those rolls of, of little bobbles there on each side of her are uh, two sheep or uh, calves um, she was a fertility goddess uh, in the roman world they would call her diana uh, but in the greek world particularly in this part of uh, ephesus in the asian area um, uh, she was a goddess of 
fertility. So if you look on there, all of those roles. Now, one of the questions is on there is what are those things? Are they, uh, some would say they are breasts. Others would say they are eggs. And then there's another that says they could be bull's testicles. So we don't know. And, and the reality is, is there is no clarity in, in uh, a lot of the various, uh, from what I was reading, there, there is no clarity on, on all of this because a lot of the things about Artemis have been lost uh, to history. Uh, but it was a major that she was, uh, this temple we know is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it was a large, huge, huge, huge building, uh, with an opening in one part of the ceiling, had all the columns around it and they would come and they would worship here. And there was a great amount of business that was tied to this, of course, with the selling and the making of her crafts. Now, some would say the argument is that maybe a comet or a meteorite had come down, a meteorite had come down into this area, and that's where they 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 speak about her coming from the sky. The statues they say are supposedly not her statue is supposedly not crafted by the man by man's hands. The one that they had displayed in the temple. Now the temple is pretty much gone uh, because of uh, time. The building was actually used. Um, let me see if I can actually get up more of that information on. Uh, my uh, uh, on on my information, I know I had some uh, fact information here. Um, it had more pictures, and I did have it up there. Um, I'm going to pull up and see if I can get that fact book up on Artemis again um, with the pictures here. Um, so here I'm going to I'm going to re I'm going to uh, merge over uh, here with the logos here, so that way we can see a little bit more. Of what is there? So, um, here is uh, here's here's the one that the presentation that I was meaning to have up fully. I apologize uh, for only having one one of the pictures here, but I'm going to scroll through here and we can talk about what this presentation. So here is the Artemis of the Ephesians, uh, and we think about Ephesus. So it was if we look where Ephesus is on this sheet here. Um, let me see if, oh, actually it didn't even pop up there. So hold on a sec. I'm going to find a way. And All right. so there we go. We see there, now you see Artemis on there. Now, Ephesus is uh, right over there. You see there where that's located within the Asian Peninsula. Um, and he preached in Ephesus. His success in, in converting Gentiles there from a worship of idols who worship a one God and God's Messiah set off a power cake. So it was a business issue there anytime it was attracted. Now, Demetrius, he was a maker of uh, souvenir silver replicas of the goddess Artemis. Uh, and she got he got a lot. And this would have been the large theater where it would have been brought, bringing in. Now, imagine the loud, the noise of that as people were yelling over and over, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and uh, not listening to anything else in, in that large bowl and how loud it would be. Um, the citizens reacted with this Artemis revival because uh, Artemis was worshipped in many of the cities of Asia Minor. This is where the temple was. Uh, just kind of give you an idea. Look at these stones and how nicely cut they are. Uh, many of them were reused. Um, so much of the the building is uh, is just rubble now. It's been ad abandoned. Um, but here's kind of an idea if you want to see this beautiful. It was about 450 feet long and 225 feet wide. Uh, had 120 uh, towering columns. So that kind of gives you a representation of what it would have looked like uh, at this time. Uh, and uh, Artemis was not known in this region in her Greek dress. She was often portrayed as a mother figure, her chest covered with symbols of fertility flanked by two deer. Scholars debate whether the symbols surrounding Artemis should be understood as breasts, eggs, as I told you about, or even bull testicles. It is clear, however, that the more ancient worship of Mother Goddess of the region was joined with the worship of Artemis when the region became part 
of the Greek Empire in about the 4th century BC. Um, so that's, again, where the statue, a smaller temple of Artemis stood beside the city hall and chamber in Ephesus near the turn of the era. A portion of this temple was dedicated to the worship of Julius Caesar. After Julius Caesar's assassination, the Senate of Rome declared him to be a god. Ephesus elders, uh, city elders, also concentrated this temple to the worship of Julius Caesar as a sign of their loyalty to the new regime of his adopted son, the Emperor Augustus. Um, so many inscriptions bear witness to the importance of both Artemis and the worship of the emperor for the life of the city. Uh, this inscription begins with the dedication of both Ephesian Artemis and Augustus. Uh, Artemis was so closely linked to the city's prestige and well-being that the Ephesians laid particular claim to her as their own. So that would be that inscription here. Um, that uh, uh, This inscription recognizes Vibius Gaius as uh, Phil Artemis Chi Phil, uh, Philosebastos, a friend of Artemis and friend of Augustus. Vibius was honored for his piety toward and perhaps financial support of the cults of Artemis and the emperor in the city. Um, Artemis was Ephesus's patron goddess and its principal claim to fame. Paul's proclamation of one god threatened the city's identity and claim to fame, as well as the livelihood of craftsmen like Demetrius, whose trade depended on the worship of Artemis. The resulting riot in the theater shows the importance of traditional gods like Artemis, to the identity and livelihood in the cities in which Paul proclaimed his revolutionary gospel. So that was David De Silva, Ph.D., put that together there. Um, so that gives us an idea of what it is that we, uh, what, what, what they were contending with. Um, so we'll go back to our main screen there. Um, and, and you can think of the bronze figure. Here, I'm going to go to another presentation kind of linking about uh, Diana now, uh, or the bronze figure of Artemis. So, um, statuettes like this and other artwork depicting the goddess Artemis were a crucial source of business to metal workers. Now, this would be more of what we're seeing here would have been uh, more traditional in most of the Greek empire at the time. Um, very clean, nice dress. Uh, as opposed to the goddess worship that we see within Ephesus. So this probably wasn't the main uh, figurine uh, that would have been found within Ephesus. Um, and that's one of the things to remember on here um, with the worship of the, of the goddesses and uh, all the various gods. Um, here is another picture of marble that I'm going to show you here. Um, So when we look at that, you know, it's just kind of give you a little bit. Um, that center part there, um, that's either, you know, the breasts, eggs, or uh, testicles. Um, but that's kind of give you a little more of an understanding of who she is and then some of the depictions and the carvings that are on her. So this is a, a more of a body detail, just give you a bigger image, to bigger idea of what we're looking at. Um, it's interesting to kind of think about how different um, it would be. I mean, uh, for us today, we probably wouldn't think of worshiping anything or find any great value in that. Um, but just in my peripheral study and some of the notes, I know others have different study Bibles, so you're going to hear different uh, notes. That's one of the benefits. Uh, some study Bibles will, will, will focus on different things. But... Um, also, some of the other things that were talked about as we were speaking on reading these verses uh, is, uh, you know, this idea of the riot. And we know that oftentimes rioting and the things like that, it's in our age today. Uh, it, you know, when people are impassioned about something, it, sometimes logic goes out the door or it goes out the window. Uh, people don't think about um, about how they're how they're supposed to act they forget decorum and the like um now we looked at the first question it says today's story comes from the third missionary journey of paul as described in the book of acts 
with all the resistance he experienced the first time. What do you think gave him the courage to go back out there again and again? And when we think about this reality, what is it that makes us and drives us to continue on? Why are some of us still called to tell others, even though it might not be popular in our family circles, which, you know, I could speak to mine, and I know that it's not the most popular thing in every part of my family circle is, you know, faith cannot, is not always an important factor. It's not a central part. And it's not for a lot of people, just because of how our world is. Uh, and sometimes it's not met with uh, great positivity. Uh, why would they, why would we keep it on? Why do you think Paul was? Cause for him, it was, it cost him his life. Well, some of the responses that did come out was, well, one was the Holy spirit. Of course, that would be a, a big factor, but, um, Paul kept going out because he understood the dangers. Uh, he understood the need to make sure that people knew the message that he understood. He wanted people to understand. He wanted people to hear Another would say, well, you know, having done his travels, he saw what was going on there and he knew the importance of making sure that more and more people would be uh, given the opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ. And that's why we keep going back and we keep running circles, too. He would keep going back as we are called to do the same. Uh, and in the city of Ephesus. What was Demetrius's profession and how did he make money? Why did he feel that Paul was threatening his livelihood? Well, when we look at the lesson, when you look in through the reading there, it says he's a craftsman. He's a silversmith. Uh, so he made a lot of money. More money would be made out of making these idols and probably other things, uh, other jewelry and other, other things that he would have done. Uh, because people would be paying more for these idols to have in their home, especially if they feel they're going to great great blessings. Now, this is a fertility idol. So if you are a farmer or, uh, a, a, or a rancher or anything like that, you want to make sure that your that that your household is very fertile. So in this mindset, if you believe in these gods, to have this idol in your home would be very important. It would be make it a lot easier for you also to offer gifts, offerings and sacrifices because you could have a mini altar nearby to be able to pray to this god or goddess. And uh, so the so these silversmiths silversmiths made a whole lot of money because. They, it would give people, they would set these up, and I'm sure some of them would have multiple places where they could go and pray and offer devotion and alms to the goddess to make sure that she would make give them a fertile harvest and great rain. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure that there, you know, are, well, there still be cultures in our world today that may do the same. Uh, and we still pray to our God, to the one true God, uh, that he also open up the rains and things to us. Now, we don't set up statues or idols around our property um, to make sure that we have a specific space to go to or something to focus on. Uh, it's easy to do, um, but um, that's just not our normal culture. In fact, uh, it would be contrary to our Christian faith to do so. Uh, so when we think about the next question here, because um, we knew that... Uh, you know, Demetrius, he was really seeing a loss of revenue, as his workers were too. So that's part of the reason. Demetrius's speech ended in riot. Why do you think it is so easy for anger to get out of control? And why is it important that these words, that we use our words to calm rather than to stir up anger? One one thing that I, I it's easy when people want to be angry about something. We know this in the last year. Uh, we've experienced it throughout the United States with uh, various riots and protests over over things. And sometimes it's very hard to um, have any conversation or dialogue because there are so much there's so much passion that's involved. So if you disagree with uh, with someone else, well, it's not just that you disagree. Um, you are you are stepping on something of high importance to them. Um as Christians, we are meant to be more of a calming presence, a calming voice. When we see these things, we want to be rational in our thinking and rational in our minds. Unfortunately, there's been some of that lacking in our world today. Um, and we can get caught up in the furor and the fervor of a moment and be very impassioned. We're human too. Everybody is Christians. We are human. We have our failings and our shortcomings. 
Uh, but our witness is greatest when we can be a voice of calm and a voice of reason, especially when there is a world that is, seems to be so filled with unreasonable thoughts and unreasonableness in action. Um, so as we think about those things, uh, think about why, uh, what it is we're called to and how we can bring calm in times of turmoil and strife, how we can be a voice of level-headedness um, as opposed to uh, stirring up and inciting anger. When it comes to that one question on here is, why do you think it is easy for anger to get out of control? Well, if you can confuse somebody um, where they need to feel angry about something, and this sometimes happens. I find it funny in our world today. We have this strange uh, tendency to sometimes be offended for someone without even knowing if they're offended themselves. Um, that's, I've experienced it in ministry, and, uh, and, I, and I'm sure others have experienced much similar. Uh, but really, the reality is, is, if, is, is before we become offended, um, it might be better for us to actually check first ourselves, uh, check the intention of the other, and maybe if there is somebody else that we feel that was directed towards, uh, see how they're doing and how they, if they felt it was something that was against them too. Um, so, um, so we're not so quick to just jump on a bandwagon and say, oh, well, I'm offended because so-and-so said this or did this. Uh, we, we just can't, uh, we shouldn't let that always be our, our guide in everything that we do. Um, and then when we think about this uh, next question, I think is quite relevant. Riots in those days and in ours reveal the danger of mob mentality. Why is it so much easier to justify our own violence when so many other people are also doing it? This is a good question that's still, that's really valid for today. Mob mentality is very dangerous. Um, critical race theory is something I spoke about in our class this morning, and it's something that's very prevalent in our world today. Not everybody understands what this is. I mean, a lot of this is what's being espoused by uh, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and it is uh, a repackaging of, of Marxism uh, in all reality. It's uh, because Marxism, if you think about the reality of Marxism, the goal, what Marxism is based upon is you have a, an oppressor class called the bourgeois, and they are the ones that have all the resources and all the money, and they're making their riches on the backs of the proletariat, the working people, the worker. Um, and what and, and what Marxism does is it says the proletariat needs to rise up and bring down the oppressor, the, the bourgeois, those that are, are oppressing them by, by, by basically working their, robbing them of their, their life because they're the ones as the workers, the proletariat, they're the ones that are, are are making the bourgeois rich because the proletariat are the ones that are doing all the work is a mentality there. And the mindset is, in, 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 in all reality, um, in a utopian type of mentality, is that if we were to make it where everybody was level, on the same level, um, and nobody ever had a need for a home, nobody ever had to worry about clothing on their back or food in their bellies, um, they have everything they need, then everything would be fine. It would be a fair and equitable society. And they use this idea, equity, um, not equality. Mm, there's the key term there. It's not about equality, but equity. And equity is uh, basically you have to bring someone else down to be able to achieve and have level a level playing field, so to speak, um, it doesn't work in society. What you see, uh, you remember anybody who's looked and remembers the Soviet Union, of course, uh, you had uh, the high end leaders, and you look at China the same way. You've got some people that are making a lot of money, supposedly in a non-capitalistic society, 
um, living high on the hog. Um, you know, Stalin and his friends were not, they, they, they were pretty well off while other people were waiting in line um, in the bread lines. We see that in North Korea today too. Um, the major issue of anything like that is there is a group that will, because of this, this stirring up, it creates a dictatorial mentality because you have to keep people in line to make sure that they understand it's for their own good. <laughs> That's the problem there. It's all supposedly for their own good, but others lift up. And it creates two different classes. You have the proletariat, the workers, and you have the bourgeois. And if you're bourgeois, in their eyes, if somebody says, ah, you're, you're an oppressor, you're an oppressor, um, then quickly you got to swat them down and they better better cowtail or else they could possibly could uh, they're, they're going to be a it could cost you your life um well today we have that similar mentality with blm uh, they've just changed the terms you have those of us that are of lesser melanin um they like to say we're white and because we're white we are white supremacists uh no matter what if you're white you're racist and you are an oppressor now you can I, you can do one of two things. You can uh, listen and uh, and repent of your whiteness, um, or you will be brought down, and your whiteness will be your, your racism will be shown and made clear. The problem is, is it's creating, and then also because everybody white has been oppressing, so the instead of saying bourgeois. It is, you are white. Those that are brown or, uh, di or indigenous, of those of black, brown, um, all of the various um, shades of brown that we really have in our world, the darker shades, the more melanin, well, you are the ones that are the proletariat. You have been oppressed. And it is your right and duty to put down your oppressor. Um, so what we're finding here is a recreation of prejudice. Uh, it is uh, it is the recycling of prejudice. It's just another prejudice, just uh, basing, basing preconceived notions about another group of people um, based on a, uh, a generalized understanding of who they are. And then, op th then wanting to make sure that they understand how wrong they are, and if they don't understand that, you need to correct their mentality. Uh, it's uh, it's a terrible, terrible ideology. Um, it's not biblical. It's it should be, and, and and really, it's not healthy for society. M to fight prejudice with more prejudice is not okay. Um, have there been wrongs in the past? Most certainly. Have there been steps to, cre to correct those wrongs? Most certainly. In my opinion, in the last 15, 20 years, we have actually stepped further back than where it was when I was a young kid. So and, um, that's my opinion, but I think uh, there are others that would probably agree with that. Um, and the reality is, is we... As Christians, our our goal shouldn't be to sit here and lambast any other group. Um, my goal, of course, is not to lambast uh, those that are in Black Lives Matter. I would just urge people to actually look at what they are talking and what they're espousing. Um, those that seem to agree with it, I think there are many people similar to the people that were in the temple or in the theater that were screaming, great is the... Great is Artemis of, of Ephesus. Great is Artemis of Ephesus. For two hours, there was no dialogue. There was nothing to be done in that two hours, and it was a waste of a waste of a lot of energy uh, because they many of them were confused, and all they thought was, "Well, I need to be offended. This is what's being attacked," and nobody was listening to anybody else, and it was just chaos and that's what we find ourselves in today in christ we have we we don't need to walk in chaos we walk in light we walk in truth 
And that's the major point of it all. So getting caught up in that mob, uh, mob mentality is a very dangerous thing to do. And Christians, we've, we've been guilty of it in our past too. And we need to repent of those things. Um, there's a lot we can repent of. We're not, we aren't, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not one against the other. It's all of us owning our sin and seeking to seeking reconciliation. So let's look at the next question here. Uh, so read of Isaiah 44, six through 11. So let's get out our Bibles and we can pull that up. And I will get that up on my screen. Hold on a sec here. All right, there we go. All right. It says, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Set the, let them declare what is to come, and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from old, from of old, and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witness neither see nor know, that they may be put to shame. Who fashions a God or casts an idol, and is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. All right. So let's see here as we go back to the questions on there. So we're going to look at the questions on our worksheet. And we find it says... Most modern-day people do not worship and bow down to statues. Uh, actually, it says, What claims does God make for himself in this passage? And what does God have to say about idols and the people who worship them? Well, he says, I am, a, I am the one God. There is no other God besides me. Everything else is an idol, and those that are fashioned, uh, those that fashion those idols are, are, are doing it for nothing. So, uh, and they will all, all be put to shame. Um, in our story from Acts, who is Artemis, and why was she so important to people of Ephesus? Why is it important to know the difference between false gods and the one true God? Well, this is kind of what I co covered from the beginning there. Um, and just talking about Artemis was a, was a deity um, that she was a, like the Mother Earth goddess. Wow, think about that way. You know, uh, let's, let's, let's reflect on that for a moment. Mother Earth, she was the one that they would pray to. Um, for good harvest and, and the like. So uh, Baal, Baal was another one that was a big one in, in the ancient Israel times. So uh, we think about all of these things in Gaia and the like and uh, how they just continually are recycled. As today, um, we look at it as, uh, as our environmentalists. Um, we want to make sure that we care for uh, the great goddess of the environment, right? Uh, and that's kind of a reality we live in today. So when we think about uh, the next question here, most modern day people do not worship or bow down uh, to statues, but there are many things we worship as idols. What are some of the earthly things that people in our day look to for security and value? And why do such idols always seem good? But end up letting us down. Well, you know, one of the some of them would take. Well, money is a major idol. It's more the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what the we read in the Bible. Uh, that um, and and it, and it becomes the idol when we place all our hopes on it, all our dreams. Uh, you see that when you look at the Tao, and you know, of course, we're all happy when the Tao is continually rising. It's getting higher and higher. We watch our. 401ks or 403bs as it would be for some of us in nonprofit worlds. Uh, you know, we love to see those numbers grow. 
uh, so that we can have that good retirement nest egg. Uh, and then there are some whose lives are just fall into fall, fall into a whole disarray when things turn in a negative way. Um, also, you find it with sports. You know, your football team that you just uh, place your hopes on. If they have a great game, you're as happy and walking on air. They have a bad game, you're just depressed and down and angry. Uh, or baseball, basketball, you name the sport. Any of those things, they can become idols. Are they all bad in and of themselves? No, nah, they're not. They can be entertainment. But there is always that risk um, when they take too much of your life that you have to worry about and wonder, uh, okay, um, when has, when does that become an idol? So, uh, so we look at it as uh, there are so many idols in our world still today that we are not free of them all. How does faith help us resist going along with the crowd? And why is it important to stand up for what we believe? Well, if you've ever... Uh, if you ever heard the old adage um, about banking and the like, um, you know one thing that every person that works as a with a, around a, a cash register or a bank teller, uh, one thing you really get to know is you get to know the feel of what real money feels like. Um, you tend to that's all you work with, uh, because you know what the authentic feels like. So all of a sudden, if you have one that comes across that is not authentic, if you have a counterfeit you will know right away because it will feel different. It will look different. You will understand that this is not real because you've been dealing with that. We don't, you don't even need to worry about showing people the fake because you, you get so familiar with the real. The same is true about our faith in the Word of God. The more we're in prayer, the more that we are in worship, the more that we are coming together as a people of God, the more that we understand what it is that God is doing, the better it is for each of us because when we when we know what the real is when we encounter the fake it'll be clear it'll be abundantly clear and uh, there are a lot of people unfortunately that today that don't know what the real faith is they don't know what the bible says they don't and and it's a matter of it's a constant lifelong study you're never done you've never I would say the only time that you are done in your in your faith development is the day you breathe your last and the Lord welcomes you home and then you know everything. You will have all the answers. But until then, we are still we are always students and we are always growing and always learning. And the goal of what we need to seek as followers of Christ is to make sure that we are seeking after the true faith that we are constantly testing our faith in the things we hear and the things we understand to Scripture because we do not want to be led astray. And in the middle of it all, you know, sometimes you may even you may say something and you may believe something. If you come across and you find in the Word that it's challenged, let that be challenged in your spirit. Don't be afraid. Wrestle with it. Don't, don't Obviously, don't just act as though Act as though, okay, I give up. Now, if you're convicted and you have a hard time with it, it's good to wrestle with that instead of easily just going and whatever the winds tell you. That's part of our problem in our world today is there's too many winds trying to dictate and go in other ways. And uh, remembering that when we come together, we pray with one another, we pray for one another, we're worshiping one God. And that's, and that's our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's, that's Jesus Christ that we know died on the cross for our sins. We know this to be true because that is what the Bible has revealed to us. And we struggle with that um, against the world at all times. We are going to be at odds, just like Paul was at odds and as were all the other uh, believers of that day. There was something about, There is something about our Christian faith that we need to continually, continually stand and be at odds against what the world is teaching. But we stand for something greater. We stand for the truth. And it's not that we're sitting there wagging our fingers going, you, 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 you got to follow the right thing. No, no, no. We share the word. We put it out there. We say, this is who God is. We show them 
this reality and we try to bring them into our midst. Um, you know, I, 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 I like to see when people grow and I, I've, my faith is continually always growing. It's not something that stalls. I mean, if I get too comfortable, ah, there's a problem. And, uh, and, and it's a matter of continually growing, developing, uh, letting the Holy Spirit work and shape and transform and take off the rough edges and continually move forward in faith. Um, trusting in what God and where God is calling and always being sharpened. Uh, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another in the faith. Uh, we are called to be continually a working vessel and something where the Holy Spirit is at work in us because we are not done until the good Lord calls us home. Well, I hope you found this study to be good. I look forward to doing the next one. I'll see you on the 30th. Um, I'll probably be putting that one out a little later simply because I do have to take my parents back to the airport. So that one I probably won't have out until um, until later that evening. But I want you to know that uh, this has always been good. And remember, God loves you, and so do I. Jesus loves you, and so do I. Be at peace. Have yourself a great day rest of your day, and be blessed in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, you have a wonderful day. God bless.